Hello and welcome. I'm Grace Kelly Miller and you're listening to No Small Recaps, the recap show for No Small Roles. This week, myself, Ben Galpin and our super fan, Sam, will be summing up episode six to nine. So get comfy and get caught up with No Small Recaps. Episode six, Luncheon and Lies. After a night stealthily exploring the Vondell estate, Juna spots the servant's entrance and moving in for a closer look, catches the eye of the half-orc cook. Whilst her concealed companions watch on nervously, Juna deftly casts Charm Person and is welcomed warmly into the kitchen, explaining to the beguiled cook, Jasana that she wandered into the estate, having lost her way. While Jasana puts the kettle on, Juna quizzes her new friend on the purpose of the folly. The cook seems to share the view that it's just posh people's stuff but let slip that the expense meant having to let go of most of the staff. It's all for a family, that's what it is. Keeping watch outside, the party see two figures exit from beneath the tower. The gamekeeper Matrim and his wife Dahlia, illuminated by Orin's glowing rock. As the pair search for intruders, Guy uses message to interrupt their gnome companion. Juna, sweetheart, we gotta get going now. Juna makes her excuses and Jasana points her in the direction of the gate. As they part ways, Mm. this Bondel lady, is she to be trusted? I would trust her with my life. As Juna hastily leads the party through the main gate, she notices an arcane eye watching them trespass and instantly regrets not going back over the wall. Knowing the jig is up, they hot foot it back to the knocking point. Gwendolyn suggests they could claim their nighttime visit was on her father's behalf. A surprise inspection of the Rose security systems? However, the growing friction between Enkidu and Gwen has them bickering all the way to the tavern, and it takes Juna backing the plan before Enkidu reluctantly agrees to some elements of her deception. Gaius and Orin are less convinced, keen to get out of Tillisham as quickly as possible. The others do their best to persuade the pair that this is about more than just a missing brewery now. They have to help for the good of the townsfolk. Utterly exhausted, they all make their way upstairs to sleep. First to rise, Orin talks to Iris, whilst tinkering with an upgrade to his goggles, revealing to the innkeeper that although they have some leads on the missing brewery, strangely they have been unable to track down the doctor. Dressed to impress, Gwendolyn and her entourage cross Savelt Square, noticing that the Palenti store is closed. Taking a closer look, town gossip Jenny pops up to tell them that Drania Pine hasn't been seen all day. But not wanting to be late for luncheon, or to be embroiled in further conversation with Jenny, they press on. Approaching the resplendent red brick manor house, the party are welcomed by Dahlia. Assuming Enkidu to be Gwendolyn's personal guard, both are shown through to the library to wait, while the others are sent to the kitchen. With the effects of Juna's charm having worn off, Jasana gives Juna the cold shoulder. However, Juna slowly wins her round without magic this time and sets about helping with the meal. Orin makes himself useful fixing Jasana's broken arcane vegetable bed, while Guy proves that his artistic talents do not extend to making a honeyed fig and almond tart and is instead shown to a room where he can warm up ahead of his performance. Upstairs to dispel the awkward silence, Enkidu draws Gwendolyn's attention to a painting of two women. It shows Lady Vondell stood next to the copperhead woman from the woods. Hanging nearby is a family portrait of Lady Vondell, her sons Trimpt and Oscan, and Lord Vondell. Pondering why they haven't heard of a Lord Vondell, a voice behind interrupts, I'm afraid he died some time ago, as the refined Lady Vondell greets them. Introducing herself as Gwendolyn Rose, Gwen claims that Fabulosa was simply a borrowed name to conceal her identity while they conducted a surprise assessment of her father's security systems. Seeing their interest in the art, Lady Vondell reveals that the copperhead woman is her sister, Metz Crollin, and that Lord Vondell passed away after contracting gallows cough. Making their way to the dining room, they observe that even though the house is richly decorated, it is oddly sparse, as though items are missing. A beaming trim arrives, presenting Gwendolyn with a poorly put together posy of flowers, which she hands to Enkidu. Finding himself left to his own devices, Guy decides to explore. Magically assuming the form of Trimped, he carefully makes his way upstairs. Remembering where the rippling arcane light was spotted the night before, Guy finds a set of locked double doors and with deft use of his thieves' tools, lets himself in. In the middle of the room stands an ancient-looking table with a reflective disc at its centre. The intricate runes arranged in circles on the table suggest it to be some sort of fortune-telling device. As he looks for instructions, Guy is distracted by a display case containing three wands. Deciding to slip the most gnarled looking wand into his back pocket, on his way out he spots a scribbled note. Flames, floods, the dead rising, 
titans tearing the world asunder. As he locks the door, a voice behind him says, Mother says we're not allowed in there, Trent, and you know that. As the younger Vondel brother, Oskin, spots the disguised Guy. However, with the help of a few less than polite hand gestures, Guy makes his escape. During luncheon, Lady Vondel explains that Kralovin Svelte ruled the area a very long time ago, before the signing of the Accords, though no one knows what happened to him. While attempting to nonchalantly ask after Dwayne, Lady Vondel reveals that Gwendolyn's elopement from her wedding has been the subject of much discussion in polite society. Quickly changing the topic, Gwendolyn requests a tour of the tower. Lady Vondel has a moment of confusion about what they have and haven't already seen, which reminds Gwen of someone they met before. While helping Juna and Jasana serve lunch, Oren surreptitiously scans the room with his goggles of magical detection, spotting a ring of enchantment on Lady Vondel and a new item in Guy's back pocket, glowing with necromantic magic. After the meal, everyone is invited to watch Gaius' performance. Despite a bumpy start, he wins the family over and is offered a 10-year contract with a hefty salary. Guy asks for a day to consider this generous proposal. When Gwen questions why her beloved bard, Dwayne, was not offered the position, Lady Vondell says that something just didn't feel right about him. Clearing up lunch, Juna questions the cook about the doctor, getting the inkling that Jasana is lying and knows more about Dr. Hograd's disappearance than she's letting on. Episode 7, Wooing and Woes After much persistence from Gwendolyn, Lady Vondell agrees to give a tour of the estate. Popping to her chambers to change into her boots and a high fantasy gilet, Gwendolyn seizes the opportunity to flirt and gather information from Trimpt. While he boasts about bridging the gap between common folk and highborn, a less than convinced Enkidu grinds his teeth and bites his tongue. On Lady Vondel's return, they begin the tour, gathering Gaius into their little group. Back in the kitchen, Orin and Juna look for an opportunity to have a sneak around the rest of the manor. At this moment, a pouting Oscan Vondel enters the kitchen demanding a meal. Juna and Orin kindly offer to take a tray of leftovers to the boys' bedchamber. Before giving our heroes very clear directions to Oscan's room, Gisana hints that Lady Vondell approved of Gwendolyn's pairing with her son at first mention of her family name, Rose. Out in the grounds, conversation continues to flow. Enkidu's services are requested by Lady Vondell should her son be betrothed to Gwendolyn. We learn that the Vondells are of mid-tier social standing, and attempts made at marrying Trim to a high-status family have been almost impossible. Gaius quizzes Lady Vondell on the Rose family under the guise of a hopeful employee waiting to be paid. It appears the Rose family have become invaluable to other nobles through their unique security business and are practically swimming in gold. As the group reach the folly constructed by the Rose family, Gwendolyn and Trint take in the wonderful view of Tillisham from the balcony. Gwendolyn asks the purpose of her father's work here. Trimpt cautiously tells her it is a safe haven to retreat to if dangers arrive. Dangers, he says, his mother has foreseen. Tray of food in hand, Orin and Juna investigate the manor house. Conveniently forgetting the directions given to them by Jazana, they make their way towards the arcane study. Using his thieves' tools, Orin picks the lock. Inside, the pair notice an intriguing wand display with one of the set unaccounted for, but what draws their focus is the large table, marked with arcane runes and a reflective disc in its center. Drawing on their investigative skills, they too discover the table can be used for divination purposes. Like an arcane clock when set to a particular time, empowering the user with a glimpse into future events. With Juna's guidance, the artificer gets to work, setting the dials for the next day, exactly 24 hours into the future. The disc shimmers and ripples like water, then shifts to form a singular globule that rises to float above the table. There is a bright flash and suddenly, the room returns to normal. They try again but find that the table lies dormant, indicating the magic must have worked, leading Orin to draw this obvious conclusion. Are we in tomorrow? Oh my god, we're, oh we're in tomorrow. God. We're in tomorrow. We're in tomorrow. Okay, what has happened? Um, um. As they frantically panic about the repercussions of their journey to the future, can they be seen? Can they get back? 
What happened with the Lord's Luncheon? Why is that wand missing? All seems much as it did the previous day, but fearing being found sneaking around the manor a full day later would mark them as intruders, they hastily head to Jazana in the kitchen, where they find the cook still doing the washing up. Did he say thank you at least? What did she say? Sorry, say that again. Did he say thank you at least? Did he say thank you at least? (laughs) We're not in tomorrow at all. (laughs) Realising their folly, the pair promised to keep it their secret. Out at the other folly, Lady Vondel collapses unexpectedly, Enkidu rushing in to catch her, and with the fainted Vondel in his arms, Enkidu reaches inside himself to call on the voices for guidance. Almost as if for a moment you can hear them talking to each other. Then you hear a very gentle voice. So it sounds female, but you know who it is. And they just say, We think she's dangerous. Be careful, Kai. I kind of, um, yeah, like intrinsically say, Thank you, my, my heart. I'll take care. As the gentlemen carry the lady towards the manor, Trimp tells Gwendolyn that through use of his mother's magic she has become prone to moments of confusion and that these falls have become commonplace. Finding themselves unchaperoned, Gwendolyn persuades Trimp to take her below the tiled floor to the door guarded by the stone dragon. Trimp assures that if she is ever in danger, to make her way to the tower and use the password DISASTER. On uttering the word, the doors swing open, showing a beautiful daylit corridor similar to the manor and immaculately kept. With this new information, Gwendolyn encourages Trim to check on his mother. Meanwhile, on their journey back to the house, Gaius and Enkidu take a moment to check Lady Vondel's possessions, finding a golden ring with a red gemstone, which swiftly makes its way into Gaius's pocket. Once inside the manor, they call for help, Gizana showing them the way to Lady Vondel's chambers, bumping into Orin and Juna on the way. Gizana begins to shoo them downstairs to let the lady rest. However... Before leaving, Enkidu has a bright idea. I'm going to take a few steps towards her. I'm going to bow respectfully and say, I pray for a swift recovery. And then I'm going to try and karate chop her neck to knock her out. Jizana rebukes Enkidu as he attempts to choke hold her to the floor, failing instantly. As she steps back, she reveals an alarm stone already activated. No matter how the party attempt to reason for and excuse Enkidu's actions, they are ordered to leave immediately. While the warlock feigns madness, Juno tries to hide under the bed, also failing instantly, as Jizana's trust is well and truly shattered. Dahlia bursts in with a drawn short bow, just as a bright and optimistic Gwendolyn and Trimpt appear at the door. In a whirlwind of confusion and apology, the group realise they have probably burned every bridge they had through Enkidu's actions, which he defends, reasoning he wanted to investigate the room for proof of Lady Vondel's treachery. Grudgingly, they decide to head back to the knocking point. However, as they near the guardhouse, they spot a crowd arguing with the captain of the guard. It looks like the town are now very much aware of their missing doctor. Episode 8 Disaster. Led by Iris, the townsfolk air their grievances regarding the disappearance of Dr. Hograd to the captain of the guard. Captain Stallen claims it was kept under wraps to avoid mass panic, and that their current leads suggest the doctor was last seen heading into the woods. Worried about another possible missing person, Gwendolyn and Juna head to Drania Pine's closed plenty store. On picking the lock, it appears that nothing is out of place, and perhaps she's simply gone out for the day. Meanwhile, the men go to the guardhouse, greeted by many an anan. They present the letter they found in the cave to Sully. They learn that no search party was sent after Dr. Hograd, and she's been missing for at least a week. Sully also lets slip that they searched the sewers when investigating the robbery at the Woodman and Wolf, and suspect magic, and perhaps the terrifying witch in the woods to be the cause. Understanding the townsfolk and the guard are too scared to venture into the woods, Enkidu suggests they should contract the party to do the job. On exiting the guardhouse, they see Jenny gossiping away with Juna, while Gwendolyn looks desperate to get away. Practically dragging Juna, the party retire to the knocking point to discuss all they have learned from the Vondel Manor and the guardhouse. Next come the theories as they piece the information together. The sewers that run beneath Tillersham could be used by the Vondels and potentially connected to the underground bunker. Lady Vondel made an odd face at luncheon reminding Gwen of Crowl from the woods and his expression when he became confused about timelines. This feeds into Orin's explanation of the divination table they found, as he theorizes that activating the table could be why she collapsed. Is the lady glancing into the future? Could this explain the words found by Gaius? Flames, floods, the dead rising, and titans tearing the earth asunder. 
Orin questions Gaius about the source of the necromantic magic he noticed in his back pocket, at which point he reveals the missing wand from the study. Orin also confirms his stolen ring holds enchantment magic. How are these items connected? And what connects all the other figures? The gamekeeper and his hidden necromantic book written by Kralavin Savelt. Vondel's sister, Metz, luring travellers to the cave before robbing them of their rations and medicines and Kral in the woods bringing dead creatures back to life. Could the Vondels be moving all their belongings below ground? Are they hoarding in preparation for the coming danger? Three options become clear, as Gaia sums up. All options are bad, but which one are we going to gain the most out of? Do we go to the woods, or do we go to the tower? Do we go to the sewers where we think we'll get more answers? Which one do we think we'll get more answers of? All options are bad. The party votes, with the majority in favor of returning to the folly to investigate that bunker. So under cover of night, our adventurers stealthily make their way back to the manor, expertly reaching the folly undetected. Gwen turns the brick, revealing the staircase down into the bunker. Orin, deciding to err on the side of caution, waits with Enkidu at the top of the stairs, while Gwendolyn, Juna, and Gaius head below. The ladies hold hands for guidance as the password is spoken. Disaster. All three are suddenly blasted by the ice-cold breath of the dragon statue, almost knocking Juna and Gaius unconscious in one hit. Realising the password is ineffective, Orin quickly investigates the dragon statue to try to find a way of disabling it, but to no avail, as the dragon sentinel is built as the perfect defence mechanism. Below, Gaius and Juna use their magic to heal themselves, just as the statue crackles with a second wave of energy. Attempting to flee back up the stairs, Gwendolyn trips, taking Gaius down with her. As they look up, they see a wave of sickly green energy wash over them. The noxious poison drops both Gaius and Juna to the floor. Gwendolyn, holding on by her last breath, grabs her old friend and attempts to drag her unconscious body up the stairs. In desperation, Orin and Enkidu attack the statue with all their might, but the dragon is too strong and it pulses with energy once more, preparing to attack. Seeing the oncoming storm, Gwendolyn leaps to safety, leaving her friends on the stairway. As a bolt of lightning surges from the dragon's mouth, Orin turbocharges his leg brace, using his doubled speed to rush down and pull Gaius away from harm. Enkidu continues to pelt the statue with his eldritch energy as the last flaming breath roars down the stairway, consuming Juna with its wrath. Then Juna and Guy, if you could both make death saves. Juna dies. <gasps> oh, and Gaius? <laughs> Gaius dead as well. Orin leans over to hear Gaius' last words. Run, as he bids us anon for the last time. Immediately, the artificer races to Juna. It's our secret. She rasps as death takes her as well. Dragging her limp body up the stairs, Orin sets his bees to work, knitting the wounds, but no life is returned to his friend. Enkidu, unwilling to accept defeat, tries all he can. He grabs Lady Vondel's ring and desperately prays to his patrons for help. Summoning them all and hearing their call in return, he asks for light, and they appear before him in all their splendor. Smiling at him, light moves to Gwendolyn and saves the only person they can, wrapping the monk in a deep, healing embrace. All their options exhausted, our adventurers struggle to come to terms with what has happened. Orin relentlessly striking the dragon statue with his hammer. They know they have to escape. Taking up the bodies, they abandon any attempt at stealth and with heavy hearts flee into the woods. As they pass the gloomy omen of a graveyard surrounding a chapel, Orin spots a statue of the shrouded lady, a symbol of death, with her arms stretched out towards them. The faithless Orin whispers a hopeless prayer as they pass, but deep down he knows the gods will not help him. Far from the town, as the sun rises they slump with exhaustion. For hours they stay motionless, eventually deciding to follow the river and locate the witch, Enkidu scanning the trees to find a remote spot to bury his friends. They walk for hours besides the river, sharing the weight of their fallen companions between them. Along the journey, a grief-stricken Orin speaks quietly to Juna, muttering the kind of nonsense she would have loved. As he walks, Orin recalls a moment with Juna the previous day, as they mischievously searched the house together and discovered the divination table exactly 24 hours ago. Orin blinks and finds himself back in the study on the previous day, Juna pointing out the runes needed to activate the table. Understanding washes over Orin like a wave, causing him to vomit, before rushing over to Juna and hugging her with all his strength. As his memory of the past day begins to glaze over like a dream, the divination table grants our heroes a second chance. Episode 9 Sourdough and Second Chances 
As Juna gets to work cleaning the vomit with some bread from Oskin's lunch tray, Orin realises that he alone seems to remember the events that have unfolded since setting the divination table. Struggling to explain to Juna what he has witnessed, he claims they need to... We need to get the others and we need to get out of the house now. Otherwise, the future will all go wrong. Taking Oskin's food upstairs, they find him sitting on his bed, reading an old book found by the gamekeeper Matrim in the woods. In return for a look at the cockatrice egg, Oskin reveals the book, written in Celestial, tells the history of Rumath Tarabor before he became the first king of Trevay. It appears to be written by some mage, I think, Sir Belt, which is really cool because there's a statue of him in, in town. There's a whole square named after him. And is written as if the author was living at the same time as Tarabor. Oskin agrees to trade the book if they find a better one in the woods. Leaving the room, they hear a commotion downstairs as Gaius and Enkidu carry the unconscious body of Lady Von Del to her bedroom under Jezana's supervision. As Enkidu bows and goes to strike Jezana, Orin steps in to stop what he knows is about to happen, preventing the attack. As Jezana shuffles everyone out of the door, Orin quietly tries to convince Gaius to put back the ring he stole from Lady Von Del's finger. Downstairs, the party meet Gwendolyn and Trinch returning happily from their visit to the Folly, and as they all make their way outside, Gaius reluctantly removes the ring from his pocket and drops it on the floor, shoving Orin with his shoulder as he leaves. Before the party makes it back to town, Orin tells them they are about to see Iris leading a crowd outside the guardhouse. Juna reveals he can see the future now, much to Gaius and Enkidu's confusion and to Gwendolyn's delight, who is positively bubbling with excitement after her discoveries during lunch. Skirting past the crowd, they make their way back to the knocking point, where Orin attempts to explain that he has lived through the next day already. We did set the dial to one day into the future, and we thought, I thought, that we'd gone into the future, but actually what you're talking about is that it fast-forwarded to the future and brought us back again, but it's only you who remember, because you were the one that did the magic. But that the future all went wrong, and they need to make different choices this time, although he seems reluctant to go into too many details of what happened. Plotting their next steps... Gwen explains that Lady Vondel appeared confused about timelines at lunch, and that the basement of the folly contains an almost complete replica of the manor. It seems the family are prepping for an incoming disaster. As Juna tells the others about the book Oskin was reading, Enkidu and Gwen are reminded of the connection they made before. The crowd who Gwen and Guy met in the woods could be Kralavin Savelt. Meaning if he wrote that book, he could be over 600 years old. Deciding to return to the woods in search of Kral and the witch, the group stock up with some supplies provided by a distracted Iris, and, despite Gwendolyn's best efforts, fail to gain any support from the pessimistic town folk in the tavern. The party set off, following along the riverside trail, passing the graveyard and the statue of the shrouded lady, which appears to be in a different posture than in Orin's vision. As evening falls, Gwendolyn picks out a spot to camp for the night where Guy sets up an incredible shelter and, exhausted from his efforts, settles down to sleep, leaving Enkidu and Gwen to take first watch together. Yikes. Despite Gwendolyn's attempts to clear the air between them, asking Enkidu, What have I actually done to you to make you behave this way to me? Neither seems to think the other can be reasoned with, and several hours pass in a tense silence. As Juno and Orin enjoy a twain tied tea during their watch, it appears Gaius is having a bad night's sleep. In his dreams, Guy spots his brother Brutus at a dock. Suddenly his vision goes red and he finds himself drowning, grabbing at rocks, unable to breathe, before waking with a start. He attempts to reassure a worried Juna and Orin with a fib that he was dreaming of a dragon. The second day in the Lockhold Wood seems to be passing uneventfully, when suddenly a panicked horse runs in front of them. It's Gwen and Guy's companion, Bessie and following closely behind her is a ravenous owlbear pursuing its prey. The party leaps into action to defend Bessie, and as the owlbear sinks its sharp claws and beak into Bessie's side, they attack the creature. Gaius lights the owlbear up with fairy fire, helping Orin and Enkidu strike from afar with arcane fury. And as Juna lifts the owlbear's head up with her necrotic hand, Gwendolyn rushes in, nearly losing consciousness from the ferocity of the creature's attacks before landing the killing blow. As the party recover from their encounter and calm the frightened horse down, 
they hear a rustle from behind the trees as a familiar voice asks, Do you want me to fix this one for you too? And I'm sorry to say we'll be getting caught up with Kral in episode 10 as our adventurers continue their quest for answers. Thank you, Ben Galpin, and thank you, Sam Oakes, for joining us this week. Now, Sam, at the start of the episode, I introduced you as a No Small Role superfan. Would that be a fair description? <laughs> yeah, you can definitely call me a super fan. I mean, I'm a fan of D&D podcasts in general. I listen to a lot of the mainstream ones and uh, probably quite a few of the more obscure podcasts as well. But I often find myself flitting between them. Like sometimes if I want something that's, that's purely combat, I'll listen to a certain podcast. And if I want something that's really uh, more about the characters, then I'll listen to another one. And I think what I love most about No Small Roles is that there's a perfect balance of both. The combat always seems like it could go anywhere, and it it sounds like David has plans up his sleeves for every single encounter. You know, whether there's going to be a fight or not, he knows exactly what's going to happen. But the thing that I have to praise No Small Roles about is the characters themselves. I mean, they are so rich, they are so uh, realistic. You know, they have their flaws, they make their mistakes, and that makes it so exciting to listen to, because you never know where it's going to go. And, um, I don't think David does either. Well, thank you very much. That makes us feel very special. So, does that mean you'd be up for recapping for us again? If you'll have me, I would love to come back. I've really enjoyed doing this. Uh, This is just phase one of my plan to um, take over the show and eventually be the star character in the campaign. Ooh, or maybe the big bad villain. I'll chat to David. Excellent news, I think. Thank you all for listening to No Small Recaps. And none for now.